is going on guys welcome back in this video today we're going to learn how to do hashing in python and why this might be useful so let us get right into it All right, so we're going to learn about hashing today and we're going to also learn how to do hashing in Python. But before we get into any of the practical stuff, I would like to briefly cover some very basic theory of hashing. So what is hashing? What is hashing used for? And what is the difference between hashing and encryption? Because a lot of beginners like to confuse those two. They like to think that they're the same thing, which they're not. And uh, so I'm going to clarify that briefly here by using my favorite visualization tool paint. And I'm going to use a very simple example. Let's say we have here uh, some message and let's say there's some secrets in this mes message that you don't want anyone to just be able to read. So we put an S on it for secret. So what you do is you take that message and you encrypt it. I'm going to denote this here with E. So you take this readable message or maybe in the case of an application, it's a usable application and you turn it into something that cannot be read, cannot be used. So it's basically useless but every time you do that, you have the goal of some, uh, at some point in the future, you want to be able to decrypt this again. So maybe you want to send this to someone and they can decrypt it back into the original form with a password. And this, of course, can be done with the same password in the case of symmetric encryption uh, or with different keys in the case of asymmetric encryption. But um, every time you encrypt something, you also want to be able to decrypt it back into the original form. You don't just encrypt it to leave it there in an unreadable form. You want to take this unreadable form and you want to turn it back into the original. Uh, that's the purpose of encryption and decryption. With hashing, you have a different use case or you have a different uh, procedure altogether. You have something, for example, a message. We're going to, I don't know if we want to have a secret message, but you have some message here. Uh, and when you hash it, denoted by H here, you're going to get a hash as a result. So for example, something like F, two, A, three, four, seven, D. Now, do we have pairs of two? No, we need an E maybe in the end here. So we get some hash basically, but this hash does not have enough information uh, so that we can reproduce the original. So we cannot turn this back into the original. This is not possible. We cannot dehash the whole thing because it doesn't contain enough information to do that. And that's also not the purpose of hashing. If you want to do that, what you do is encrypting stuff. With hashing, you can just confirm that the output um, is basically the same for a number of different use cases. So hashes, good hashes at least, have the property that a slight change in the input, even if you change just one byte, one bit, a very small portion of the input, you're going to get a radically different hash. So it's not going to just change a little bit, it's going to be completely different. If I change one letter a little bit in that message, I'm going to end up with something like, I don't know, 8, 8, C, 7, or something that's completely not what we had uh, before the change. So this can be quite useful when comparing passwords, for example, or when trying to confirm that what you get is actually what you uh, what you're supposed to get. So maybe someone gives you a hash, tells you, OK, whatever you get from me or, or, or the message that I sent you has this hash. If it doesn't have that hash, it's not the message I sent you. Um, you can then get the message, you can hash it and you can see, OK, it's the exact same hash, because if there was even a slight change, it would not result in the same hash. And uh, one reason why hashes are also not reversible is because multiple messages, uh, even though it's very unlikely, uh, multiple messages or multiple inputs can produce the same hash. So this might be message A here. Uh, this might be message B here. And uh, even though it's very unlikely that this is going to happen, it's not very useful to try to do that. Uh, but multiple different messages can produce the same hash which is why you cannot reverse it because would you end up with this or would you end up with this? That's uh, yeah, not really something that you can do with hashing. So we're going to talk about a practical use case here in the end, but for now we're going to just get into Python and cover the very basics. We don't need to install anything, uh, anything external. We can just use the core Python module hashlib or the core Python library hashlib. Um, and we can create a hashing object um, by specifying an algorithm. So I can just say here h equals hashlib.new and I can provide the name of the hash. For example, uh, I can use the secure hash algorithm 256, SHA 256. 
Um, or I can also just use the function directly. So I can say hashlib dot sha256. This is also uh, a possibility. And if you want to have a complete list of all the hashing algorithms available, you can just go ahead and say print hashlib dot algorithms available. And then you can see here all the different hashing algorithms that you can choose from. Um, some of them are not going to be available for all operating systems. So if you want to make sure that uh, if you want to have the guaranteed list, so the list of those that are guaranteed to work on any system, you can also call hashlib dot algorithms guaranteed. And then you get only those that are available on all systems. Um, so you don't have to worry about compatibility. But the most commonly used one is SHA-256 or maybe SHA-512. Um, it's considered to be secure as of right now. And how can we now hash something? We can just say h equals hashlib dot. I'm going to use new here, SHA-256. And then in order to apply the hash onto an input, what we do is we say h dot update. And here we put in whatever we want to hash or whatever we want to compute the hash for. So for example, I can take the message hello world with an exclamation mark. And uh, the important thing is it needs to be in byte form. So I need to add a B in front of it, or I have to call encode on the string. Uh, but then I basically said, okay, this is the mass a message that I want to hash. And if you want to get the actual hash now, what you can do is you can print the result of calling either the digest function or the hex digest function. Uh, basically, the result is the same in terms of content, but the representation is a different one because here you get uh, the raw bytes and here you get a hexadecimal um, representation of the bytes. And this is the, rec uh, the recommended way to do this, uh, to do hex digest, because here uh, there are no characters that cannot be processed. There are no characters like uh, invisible taps or vertical taps or something like that. Uh, that you can miss, you have just codes, and you just have hexadecimal values from basically zero to nine, and then from a to uh, f. And this is then the result of that. So why is this useful now? Why would I want to have the hash of hello world? Now, maybe you don't want to have the hash of hello world, but maybe you want to have the hash of um, a password. So maybe someone wants to log into your system. And it's generally not a good idea to store the passwords of your users in clear text. Why? Because if someone compromises, if, you, if your database gets compromised, people are going to be able to see the clear text passwords and emails of all the people. So they're going to see all of your thousands, uh, uh, thousands of users in your system and their passwords in clear text. And a lot of the users are going to have the same password somewhere else. So this is really not a good thing to do. And this is not something that anyone does as far as I know. So you don't want to store clear text passwords in the database. What you want to do is you want to hash the passwords. And when the user logs in, you don't want to compare the password to the hash, but you want to hash also the input and you want to uh, compare the two hashes. If the hashes are the same, um, the password is most likely the correct one. So let's say, for example, I have the correct underscore password and the correct password is my password one, two, three, five, six, seven, I skipped the four deliberately. Um, and what I can do now is I can, I can encode that or I can hash that. So I can say correct password dot encode. And I can compute the hex digest of that. In this case, that would be the hex for this password. So I can just say password hash, this is what I would store now in the database. So this instead of the password, instead of my password, one, two, three, five, six, seven, I would store this hash in the database. Um, and now if a user puts in a password, so let's say user input equals, and user input is, for example, my password, one, two, three, five, six, seven as well. Then I can do the same process here, I can uh, compute the hash. So actually, I want to do that. I can say hash equals hash dot new SHA-256. Then update the hash to or calculate the hash of user input, then I can print that. So basically h dot hex digest. And you can see, uh, actually, I don't print this one. You can see that I get the same hash. Now, Let's see what happens if I only change a small 
value here. So let's say I change five to four. What you can see here as a result is that I get a completely different hash. There are no similarities here. Uh, they don't seem to be closer than other hashes. So a slight change in the input uh, leads to a completely different hash, which is why this is uh, good for comparing passwords. Because if I know roughly your password is my password and something, um, I will not get a similar hash to your hash, I will just get um, a completely different hash. So um, if the hash is correct, we're going to get a, uh, we're going to get the same hash if the password is correct. So we can print here. Actually, instead of printing this, I can just say, input underscore hash equals, and then you can just make a comparison. And so you don't have to store the password of your user in clear text, but you still have a decent level of security. So you can say here input hash equals password hash. And in this case, this is going to be true. So that's one use case of hashing. Another one is to be able to guarantee that something is actually what you're uh, expecting it to be. So for example, on most websites, like here on voidtools.com, everything I have a video on the software this is just a basic search software. Uh, but this is true for almost every installation page, you see some download links like download installer, uh, the different installers that are available here. And what you can see down here is we have this SHA-256. And for other websites, it might say uh, checksum, it might say hash, it might say something like that. But when I now download this file here, um, I can download it into my working directory, or actually, this was not my working directory. Let me change that Python current, here's my working directory. And I also want to download the basic installer here, for example. Uh, what happens then is, this is my video directory, there you go. Um, here we have now the two files, if I open up this file, you can see that I have a file full of SHA-256 hashes. Uh, and the corresponding file. And the file that I have here is this one. This is the first line, uh, or actually the second line. This is the file and this is the hash for the file. Now, why do I even need that? I mean, I have to file, why do, why do I need the hash of the file? Uh, the reason is that sometimes you might be the target of a hack, you might be the target of an attack. And when you download the software, you think you're downloading the actual software, but maybe something is happening behind the scenes in the networking connections, and you're actually downloading something else, uh, something that might be quite similar might have the same icon, the same name, and roughly the same functionality, but there might be some malicious code in there, which you're not going to be able to detect. But if you compute the hash and the hash is the same hash as on the website, uh, you know that it's probably the exact same piece of software. So I can copy this now. And I can paste it down here, or actually, let's just get rid of this stuff here. Uh, I'm going to say here, um, correct underscore hash is this, this is what I'm expecting now. And now I can go ahead and say, with open everything, whatever the executable name is, read bytes mode, SF, I can say the file bytes are equal to f dot read, then I can create a new hash SHA-256. Then I can say h dot update file bytes. And then I can say that the file hash is equal to h dot hex digest. And then I can say print file hash equals correct hash. If that's the case, in this case, it is, it's the same file. If I just change anything about the hash here, like maybe I change this to a B, it's not going to be the same. And also, if I change anything in the file, if I somehow inject some code into it, if I manipulate the file in any way, it's going to not have the same hash, um, almost guaranteed to not have the same hash. And I know that something is wrong. And that something is not the way it should be. Now, one last thing is in Python 3.11, I cannot uh, show you this right now, because I don't have Python 3.11 installed. Uh, I have Python 3.9 still, but in Python 3.11, you have also the possibility to just say, digest equals hashlib dot file underscore digest. And you can pass the file pointer. So you could just say, 
Uh, I think you still have to do hex digest afterwards. You can look that up in the documentation. Um, but essentially, you can just digest the file directly. You don't even need to read from it. You can just file digest file and you need to also specify, of course, SHA-256. This is just something that is available in the most recent Python version. I just wanted to mention this here for the sake of completeness. Uh, completeness. But this is how you do hashing in Python and this is why you do hashing in Python. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something. If so, let me know by hitting the like button and leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell to not miss a single future video for free. Other than that, thank you much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.